On behalf of the East West Center and the friends of the East West Center, I want to welcome you to this very special gathering of the China Seminar. Today, we reflect on more than 40 years of the China Seminar. The fact that more than 200 of you have registered to be here is a tribute to the man who brought us all together over those 40 years, Professor Daniel Kwok. Danny is our inspiration. He was the China Seminar convener, presiding scholar, occasional speaker, guiding spirit, and of course, chief menu planner. Since China Seminar first began, there have been more than 350 talks by 250 speakers on a wide range of topics about China, followed by an excellent lunch at Maple Garden Restaurant. As we transition now to China Seminar Online, we wanna begin by recognizing Danny Kwok's China Seminar with this video retrospective. Professor Dan Kwok inaugurated the China Seminar in 1978, bringing together China scholars, diplomats, journalists, and other professionals to talk about all facets of China, its rich history, politics, culture, economics, arts, and music. From the beginning, Maple Garden Restaurant on Eisenberg Street was home to the monthly gatherings. Since 2008, Maple Garden owner Richard Lamb has presided over the kitchen. The rule was that after a good talk to fill the mind, came good food to fill the stomach. Richard worked to meet Danny's exacting standards. The menu is always, uh, we will discuss with uh, Dr. Kwok. So Dr. Kwok will think about all the customer, what they want, and he also want to of course, it makes the traditional Chinese food for everybody to enjoy. Even though he gave me a book about the cooking, and he told me a lot of secrets, so what should I do? Or, because uh, original, I don't have any, you know, any idea with something. But he will tell, he will tell me to do that one and get me some picture or idea from his friend or from his cooking. <laughs> Dr. Kwok is, when he do everything, is very serious. He have to be one direction to do if going, something going wrong. He's like, his attitude is all changed. <laughs> Sometimes it makes me nervous. <laughs> that's, the, that's the main thing I remember. So I have to make sure everything's going smooth. Former anchorman Bob Jones has been a China seminar speaker. When Bob did his first documentary on China in the 1980s, Danny generously shared his insights into China and the Chinese in Hawaii. So I went to the UH's number one China scholar, Dan Kwok. He tutored me a bit. And so I feel today I can write quite knowledgeably about uh, China's minorities and their politics and their military. And I really owe that this transition from being Bob the European guy to Bob the Asian guy to uh, Dan Kwok and the China Seminar. I don't think anybody can ever say a bad word about him. Um, he has worked so hard and people here just really didn't know much about China. And he was the oracle, if you will, for most of it. There were a lot of anthropologists and others that had done some work there. But Dan understood the workings of China, especially during the Mao years. So I think the UH was exceedingly lucky to have him on the staff. The whole idea of returning uh, to bring greater glory or riches back to the family and the clan is always very much there. It's nursed by an old habit uh, of the great tradition of the imperial civil service exam. Uh, the whole family supports this person to do well. 
by going to Beijing or Nanjing to, to, to score high in the exam so that after he becomes successful, the whole clan uh, uh, is glorified. Danny often spoke at the China seminar, occasionally reporting back on observations from his trips to China. Others who have given talks have fond memories of their China seminar experience. The China seminar is able to promote understanding of China in Hawaii. And also it was, it was able to get together, not just town and gown, but also uh, retired diplomats and, uh, uh, and other speakers from abroad. And through that, uh, the community is able to get together, greet each other, and enjoy the speakers together. Since the pandemic began, we were not able to meet together uh, and, and be able to uh, renew our to renew our friendships and all and etc. Uh, I really miss the sem the seminar. Uh, Zoom just does not do it credits. I miss the uh, good conversations, the warm friendships, and uh, I'm looking forward to having it resume in its uh, usual, its old venue, and uh, and be able to also see Daddy once a month. I loved uh, participating and 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 and. And and, the, and still love participating in the China seminars meetings. Uh, it was great that Danny would he he the topic wasn't always something as heavy as the Tiananmen massacre. Danny knew how to uh, have it include uh, Chinese food, uh, movies, uh, Alison Connor's presentation about movies. So um, it was a whole range of subjects. Uh, one anecdote about uh, from Danny, which I love to tell people, um, the food at the at the um, at, at the Maple Garden didn't change very much. It was pretty much the same dishes. It still is the same dishes every time. They're all good. But one of the one of the famous uh, dishes is uh, is a pork dish in which um, the meat has kind of a um, of a very uh, um, it moves a lot on your plate. And um, Danny told the story, I don't know whether it's apocryphal or not, but the, it's a great story that at, that this dish was served at the famous banquet for uh, Richard Nixon and his wife, Pat Nixon in February, 1972, during the famous visit, which helped to uh, ultimately bring about US China relations. And uh, According to Danny's story, at some point during the banquet, Pat Nixon, sitting next to Premier Zhou Enlai, asked him what the name of the dish was. And he told her the name in Chinese, his version of the name, which translated into ladies quivering buttocks. And the thought of the very prim uh, Pat Nixon being told this by Joe and Lai and the smile that was probably on the corner of, of Joe and Lai's mouth as he told the story was a was a a, a, a rich thought to have. <laughs> so that's my um, my that's my contribution to this very well deserved uh, tribute to uh, Danny and his founding and leadership for 50, forty years of uh, of the China Seminar. I just wanted to say um, I've been thinking about this. Why? Uh, I think it's such an excellent program and why I think people got so much out of it. The first reason is just uh, because of Dan Clark. He's a wonderful host, he's a perfect host, uh, ideal to manage a talk like this, so kind to his speakers uh, and um, bringing the people in that he did. It was a pleasure. Um, and second, I would say, uh, are the participants including people who attended, many people attended, you know, lots of the seminars and really benefited over a long period of time. And the people who spoke uh, and Dan arranged for a mix of speakers, Hi. local There's talent a China uh, would speak, uh, people from outside of Hawaii would speak and you would have a chance to hear them. 
And you would hear, you know, you couldn't go to all, but you would hear a whole range of topics and be with people, um, not just the speakers, but the people who attended, who cared about China and all kinds of Chinese issues. And you would have a chance to meet them, to talk with them. I uh, am to hear about uh, their interests. So that is another, the people that Dan brought together, I think as speakers and as attendees were very special. Um, I also like, and this is, this is due to Dan, I love the format, having spoken in it a few times. Um, Dan explained it to me when I first got here and gave a talk. He said, uh, first the speaker gives the talk and you have 25 to 30 minutes, which is enough time to do a real talk, really give people something, but not too long to keep people from their lunch. So it was kind of an ideal. And you always knew when you should stop, you know, because uh, the Maple Garden people would start bringing in lunch. So uh, Dan told, so you knew that was your cue, well, wrap it up. Uh, but Dan told me, of course, and he's absolutely right. You know, otherwise you have the speaker, you know, just sort of, uh, trying to bolt down some food before giving the talk, thinking, what about my slides? Uh, or the speaker has the talk and everybody else is eating. And this is no good. So um, his view was the speaker would first talk, then everybody would be able to eat lunch together. And that's just so humane, so perfect. Everybody could enjoy. And you could talk to people at the table. You could talk more to the speaker. Now you heard their interests. I mean, it's a wonderful way to do it. It's very humane. I think, you know, in Chinese societies, people don't make you wait for your lunch that way. And this, everybody could have it together. I really, I really like that very much. And I, I think that's part of the reason for, uh, and his organization for uh, the success uh, of the program. I first attended a China seminar in 1993 and spoke at one for the first time in 1994. Early on, I wondered what made these low key events so stimulating and rewarding. Honolulu is not the epicenter of Synology, and yet the seminar managed to attract a remarkable variety of speakers with expertise on a seemingly infinite number of topics. Just as importantly, with few exceptions, the speakers delivered finely crafted talks that provided unique insights. After years of research, I think I've found the answer. People who know Dan Kwok won his approval. Even now in my 70s, presenting at the China seminar is like an oral exam before your favorite professor the one who both challenged you intellectually, but also provided moral support and genuine friendship. For me, this has spent, meant spending more time than I expected researching top, topics that I thought I already knew. Each talk to the seminar has deepened my understanding of China. The process of researching those topics also made me a better teacher because it gave me a, a richer understanding of the way students learn. The interaction with the teacher in selecting the subject owning the approach, ensuring that important elements are not overlooked. But all of those are side benefits. For me, the primary objective has always been to see Dan's smile of approval at the end of my talk. This past year has deprived us all of that personal contact, but I am convinced we will have it again and sooner. Until that time, the foundations laid by Danny over the past 40 years have kept the China seminar standing when other such institutions faded away. China to the United States. Dan was really at the vanguard of welcoming, uh, you know, um, uh, groups of scholars and travelers coming from mainland China to Hawaii, to Hawaii, and really kind of focusing on building those relationships and kind of rebuilding the connections um, between Hawaii and mainland China, which of course had, you know, been difficult um, in the period after 1949. So, you know, he really, um, both within his own kind of scholarly field, but also as a you know, essentially an ambassador from UH Manoa um, to, to China, um, particularly mainland China. Uh, he just did incredible work starting in the 1970s, but of course continuing up until the present, um, because I think he's always been such an important member of the community in terms of building bridges and uh, helping to raise awareness and enthusiasm and respect for China and for, uh, you know, really just kind of cultural and, uh, you know, uh, kind of um, uh, multicultural and intercultural diversity in all its forms. I really feel like his voice has always been so strong um, in terms of that, uh, that need for respect and for mutual respect, you know, that, that really it's about um, cultures coming together and uh, peoples from different parts of the world, you know, coming together as equals, which I think has always been such a, um, 
you know, an important message and one that UH, I think, has always been among the leaders of that. Um, but, you know, Dan was really, I think, very important in terms of maintaining that um, perspective, even at times, you know, particularly during the Cold War when it wasn't always so easy <laughs> to do that, right? So I think that was one of his important contributions there as well. Just in light of all of Dan's personal qualities, I, I do think he he really fulfills the heart of what it means to be a, in fact, a Confucian gentleman, right? He is a Jinza. And I think that that, um, that aspect of, you know, respect and benevolence and tolerance and all those really wonderful qualities, he has truly embodied them for many decades. Well, good afternoon and aloha from Hawaii. Uh, my name is Richard Volstek, I'm president of the East-West Center and, and of course a long-term uh, China seminar uh, member. And uh, it's my job to uh, say a few more, make a few more comments of, and some thanks, and then to uh, open it up to uh, 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 people who want to speak from our participants uh, tuning in today. Um, I'll talk a bit about that in a moment, but first let me let me give sincere thanks to Gerald and his daughter, Lauren, who put together that terrific, terrific video at relatively short notice. And uh, it's it's really captures, I think, the spirit of not only uh, our founder and leader, uh, Professor Danny Kwok, but also what animates for so many decades uh, already and going forward, the China Seminar. Um, I'm happy to say that uh, I was one of the founding members back in, I was a graduate student at the University of Hawaii. And even though I was in the philosophy department doing my PhD, I was a teaching assistant in the history department. And uh, although I did not work directly uh, as an assistant to uh, Dr. Kwok, I, I did work with Dick Morris, who was a Japanese historian and, and Brian McKnight. Some of you may remember who was a, a historian of Chinese uh, traditional law. And, uh, but the next year, 79, after the China Seminar was first kicked off, I had the honor of joining a, a relatively small group of UH and Hawaii people on one of the first academic trips into mainland China after a uh, change in recognition in November of 1979. And it's there where I really saw uh, Danny and all his multiple parts. Uh, the intellectual historian I knew from being on the on the, uh, working with the history, history faculty, but his intense interest in art, uh, architecture, music, food, of course, music, and all aspects of Chinese cultural uh, activities and saw the importance of how they should be, they make up a total cultural picture and to be a, really a China hand, you couldn't just focus on a narrow area. Um, and so when I was, I must say there's a great that great photo we saw in the advertisement uh, for this, this seminar as well as the closing photo in the video has got that classic Danny Kwok look on his face with that seraphic smile. And of course we all know his explosive laugh as well as being a great uh, uh, a great legacy to all of us and sometimes uh, uh, reducing tension but always, uh, uh, an uplifting kind of ex experience. And we're so, I'm so happy that Ted Kwok, his son, has got the same laugh. So it's going to be a continuing tradition of laughter in the Kwok family as well. But I, I, I thought I would just take a moment to try to characterize one thing that I think why Danny has been so successful as a leader of the China Seminar, when the China Seminar itself has been so successful itself. Uh, a couple of speakers have mentioned that uh, Danny's personality as a Jinza, as a Chinese gentleman. But you know, I, I, when I think of uh, Danny, I think of a calligraphy example, something again, he has great love for. Um, is that when we, all of us, when we try to start Chinese calligraphy, we start with, there's about five different kinds of calligraphic styles, start with the seal script, but really the one that people learn calligraphy from is Kaishu the standard or regular script. And you learn 
that as you're trying line by line trying to build the characters on on paper uh, calligraphically, that that yin yang principle is right in the center of it. The black lines from the ink and the white space interplay with each other. And a good Chinese character is not like a military guy at attention, like a boxer in a, a dynamic stance. The spacing between and the dynamics between the line and space are really difficult to achieve properly. And if you do it, then you're basically gaining the, it's, it's, it illustrates the principles of what human life should be like, balance and harmony, but tension in that balance and harmony and not awkwardness. And of course, the great calligraphers of Chinese history and today uh, do a cao shu, which is a, a cursive script. And what's interesting about cursive script, when you first look at it, it's, it's, it's wild on the paper. But if you look closely at it, even though the running brush is, uh, is quite different from the standard script, you still see the same principles of balance and harmony and creative tension in the calligraphy. And I think the true Junza is the one who just doesn't know the rules and get the balance right, but the one who could take all those rules and make it a dynamic day by day, hour by hour sort of way or an approach to life, balancing that yin, the dynamism of yin and yang. Now I'll tell you, Danny had the yang too. He had a great frown. <laughs> so if you were if you were making a presentation and it wasn't quite on target, uh, he had that creative frown that reminded you that you better you know seek more advice on how to be correct. And so I think what that the image of that in a cursive script of the call, a calligraphy always struck me as what Danny is like. He's that special subcategory of of junza of gentleman Chinese gentleman who's gone beyond just the basic rules and getting things right, but dynamically applying those things in different environments. And I think the Chinese seminar is a perfect example of that. Uh, it covers wide ranges of topics uh, on China, somehow integrates them effectively, brings in a wide range of people, experts to aficionados and makes it work. And I think the dynamism, the creativity, uh, illustrated by cursive Chinese script is a way to illustrate, I think, the way Danny Kwok has run his life, his family, his interactions with colleagues, and his interaction with friends at the China seminar. And I think that, that image of him and the, uh, uh, the dynamism of uh, Chinese culture itself is what will continue to animate the Chinese seminar in the decades ahead. So that's my little bit. Uh, I, I, I want to, Danny has been a 50 years of mentorship for me and for many of us on this call has been significant to each of us in some way uh, or another and sometimes frequently over the years. So unlike most of our Chinese seminar, China seminars where there's a speaker who we put on the, on the grill afterwards with questions and so forth about what's the future of China, military, political, economic, whatever. Today's is a special celebration of 40 plus years of the China Seminar, an opportunity for all of us to share an anecdote or short comments about Danny and the China Seminar. Thank you very much for the opening comment and the introductory. It's my first time joining the seminar. And uh, it's uh, very nice to learn the history of this seminar and for all the people devote the time and the effort to make this uh, happen, make uh, you know, all the hundreds of the event in the past years. Uh, I'm not new Chinese American. I've been American for over 20 years. I live in Chicago, uh, but I recently uh, starting to devote my time to do more work to bridge the culture and the business practice between China and the US. Uh, I have my um, first book uh, talking about the China corporate governance uh, published early of the year. And my second book is uh, coming in November. 
uh, uh, it's also the same topic of corporate governance in China through a practitioner's lens. And uh, I was introduced to this event from a mentor who is also a corporate governance guru living in Hong Kong, I respect, who I respect very much. So I just feel like I want to say hi to everyone and just make a, a presentation over here, short introduction over here and looking forward to participate more of the event and looking forward to further connection with people who might be interested in, the, in this group. Thank you. Uh, Bill Sharp has some comments to make. Bill. Um, thank you very much. Uh, it's really great to be able to participate in this commemoration of 40 years of success of the China Seminar. My first association with the China Seminar was as a graduate student in the Department of and the Program of Asian Studies at UH. Uh, and Dr. Kwok invited me to be a door checker, ticket taker. Uh, some years later, I made a long march to the front of the room as a speaker, and uh, I had, had the opportunity to address the China Seminar on three occasions. Um, I always put a lot of preparation into preparing for a presentation at the China Seminar because I knew that it was a very astute group of people, many of whom had lived in various parts of the Far East or traveled there frequently or both. And uh, as a, a former speaker uh, once suggested just a few minutes ago, looking over and seeing Dr. Uh, Kwok's um, smile of satisfaction with your presentation and hopefully not a frown was really a great motivator for getting my act together. Thank you very much. And um, it's really great to see everybody here today. I just hope as, uh, uh, previous speaker said that um, I, I hope for the time when the China seminar can reconvene in person. Thank you. Thanks so much, Bill. Uh, good to see you. And uh, uh, we'll try to loop back uh, earlier. Uh, Phil uh, uh, Raghunath had a yes, comment. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm Phil Raghunath. I'm a, a professor of philosophy uh, in the uh, Nevada System of Higher Education here in Las Vegas. I'm new to the China seminars, but uh, I'm excited to see uh, and hear uh, all the, the work of people's recollections and so forth. And uh, I really plan to be uh, more uh, engaged with uh, your future uh, events. I just have a suggestion uh, about um, uh, on the future uh, you know, programs and so forth, these China seminars. I think it's really important to address the growing uh, Sinophobia and anti-China propaganda, and the closure of Confucian institutes on one political pretext or the other, or some propaganda charge or the other, uh, here in the United States. Uh, uh, you know, uh, dozens of uh, Confucian institutes have been shut down, and I think the China seminars need to address this issue, and uh, we need to organize, and actually we should be starting new ones and encouraging more conferences and dialogue between Americans and Chinese, of course, participants from other parts of the world. And I hope the China seminars will, will address uh, this on a, on, a, uh, on a larger scale. Thank you. Thank you and thanks for joining. And uh, as those of you who have been uh, attending the seminar in the past know that in fact, these topics have been covered and they're not dead issues, of course, there are uh, continuing permutations on not only the educational dimension, but all kinds across the whole cultural spectrum uh, that we do cover in, uh, in the, from the various speakers. Um, are there any other comments? Um, uh, there's, I've, I see some good written comments in here. And uh, um, uh, uh, I think that, uh, that um, uh, we, uh, I take this, I'm waiting for more comments to come in. I want to take this opportunity to sit, kind of in line with the last uh, commenter was that if you have suggestions uh, for speakers or topics or both actually, um, please send them to Gerald Cato and, uh, and to East West Center of Care of Diana, uh, and we will consider those. Uh, one, of the, one, of the, one, of the, one of the things that Danny has always uh, emphasized is 
and is working the networks of his friends and colleagues to find new voices, new insights, different perspectives. And that's one of the reasons that the, I think the ongoing series has not only uh, uh, lived on, but it's also thrived. So any other, any other comments at this time? Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, this is uh, echoing Richard's uh, uh, statement about uh, the openness of the seminar. I, as, as several speakers have, have mentioned, this is, this is perhaps the most open forum on China that I've seen anywhere. Um, and we are always looking for, for new, new speakers and new subjects. Um, and we have very much, we have, we've covered education, we've covered uh, many, many topics, and we uh, have been very, very fortunate over the years to have many uh, people who are not uh, from Hawaii or uh, not just passing through, um, but uh, there's a, a broad, broad spectrum of views. And I, I don't think anything has ever been off limits. Uh, and that again is, goes to Dan's, uh, his great scholarship. And his his uh, you know, a great scholar never is finished learning. Um, and the one thing I would uh, uh, question is, you know, as, as a Confucian scholar, uh, I was told uh, many years ago that uh, in, in, in in Confucian learning, uh, the student may never uh, surpass the 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 the, 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 the lecture. And um, and that certainly was not. Dan Kwok's approach. He he wanted you to challenge him to to go beyond what he had what he himself had already thought or written. Um, the you know getting together with him was like a, a tutorial. Anyway, um, as as Richard said, we'd like very much for all of you to uh, to write down any of you to write down any thoughts you have about the about the seminar itself, about Dan. Um, and also, you know, I, it's a little bittersweet right now because I think many of us were hoping that this fall we would be back in person, uh, that, you know, we, we would be able to uh, join again at the, at the Maple Garden. But I'll have to say, uh, even Richard Lamb couldn't have accommodated 125 uh, attendees for, for uh, the China seminar. So I, I suppose there, there are some virtues to being virtual. Um, anyway, uh, I, we're going to end the formal part of the session now, but as has always been the tradition at the China Seminar, we will keep the, the, the room open. Uh, you can talk to each other. Uh, it'll be free form, but um, you know, we look forward to hearing what you have to say. And I know many, many of you are uh, looking forward just to saying hello to people you haven't seen in a year or so because <laughs> of COVID. So please uh, take this opportunity to embrace one of the great traditions of the China seminar, the, the post-lunch uh, tradition. Um, unfortunately, without, uh, without Richard, it's a wonderful cooking. And uh, at this point, I'll throw it back to Diana uh, and, uh, and wish you all great health and, and, and great, great happiness. Thank you. <laughs>